Good evening, I'm Belva Davis and welcome to This Week in Northern California. Joining me tonight on our news panel are Carla Marinucci, political writer for the San Francisco Chronicle. Scott Schaefer, host of KQED Public Radio's California Report. And Tom Baker, consumer editor for KTVU News. Tom, first to you. What is the latest from Washington? Where do things stand now? Well, we've been sitting here for longer than 10 <laughs> minutes, so I'm not quite sure, but uh, I'll give you the big, the big thing. Uh, this evening, by a vote of 218 to 210, the House of Representatives approved a Republican plan, and that would raise the debt limit by $900 billion initially, and then another $1.6 trillion sometime in early 2011, but it is all linked to a balanced budget amendment which, of course, the Senate says is DOA on arrival. Uh, and, in fact, uh, they voted and basically said it's DOA on arrival. Uh, in the Senate, a Democrat plan will be voted on tomorrow, and the Republicans, in the sense, are saying that they will vote tomorrow to say it's dead before it even gets here. So you can see that these adults are really getting along with each other. Um, but the reality of the situation is we are no closer to a deal. In fact, arguably, we are farther from a deal. Uh, for the last six days, the stock market has gone down five, six hundred points. Uh, and Monday, if there's not a deal, we might see the market go into some sort of a panic. And that's a real possibility because the bad news that would flow from that would just be uh, incredible. Now, the big problem is that if this happens, the credit of the United States is lowered, the credit rating which means that most investors are going to want a higher risk premium for whatever lending is done. So what happens? Well, first, the government has to pick and choose from which bills it wants to pay. Will it pay the bonds? Certainly. Will it pay Social Security? Certainly. Will it pay the soldiers? Certainly. But out of this shortage of upwards of $200 billion a month, they're going to have to make some choices, and some people are not going to get paid, and many credit agencies will regard that no different than a default on the bonds, and so the credit rating would very likely go down. But almost every politician says, oh, we'll do this. We're not going to let this country you know, get to the edge here and fall off the cliff. That I mean, almost me, every one. That, that reminds that's me of the guy seen. that's had too much to drink to go, that goes out <laughs> driving and say, don't worry, I'll get home just fine. And you see him wrapped around a tree a mile down the road. This thing is really headed towards trouble. And I do believe that most people understand that. But there's a certain faction uh, in the uh, Congress that I think honestly believes if we wreck this thing and try to put it back together, we will put together a better thing. The trouble is, I think they don't understand that the wreckage will be so great that it could be significant to the United States in many, many ways. Because once the U.S. starts borrowing again, that risk premium that I talked about means there's only so much money out there that gets loaned. And if you're charging more for it, what happens to the private guy who's looking for a car loan or a home loan or an education loan? those prices go up as well, and they're tied to indexes that may go up as well. So this could be a terrible problem for the United States, and we're about, you know, two, three days away from seeing what really is going to happen. Do you have a sense of how it would affect local governments? Because, you know, cities and counties borrow as well. Would yeah. it affect the bond rating of San Francisco County, Alameda County, for example? It's not clear that it would do that. depends on how well prepared they are, but a lot of the money that they get from the feds might be compromised, because what's easier to do than to say to people that you've already taken a lot of money away from and keep taking money away from well, we're just not going to pay you. You're just going to have to get along with that, which could mean that more public employees get laid off, which exacerbates California's problem uh, much worse than any other, uh, much worse than any other state. So that is a real problem. The other thing that can happen, of course, is a lot of these programs that need this money just simply don't, don't uh, exist, or they have to try to borrow money at some premium. It, it, it's a horrendous problem that we're in, and it will do damage uh, at every level of government. But what's so interesting is this procedural thing that just would Ronald Reagan raised the yeah. debt ceiling 17 times. Yeah. All of a sudden, this has become such an issue. But uh, we're, we're seeing now a lot of the congressional delegation here, Anna Eshoo today, J Garamendi, Barbara Lee, all suggesting that the president should invoke the 14th Amendment if we're talking about coming on to yeah. uh, this. I mean, he, he has ruled that out. But well, he's ruled it out, but Section 4 kind of basically passed during the Civil War to guarantee that people who lent the United States government money would get paid. It says that the debts of the, the obligations mm -hmm. of the United States shall not be ignored. So the, that does present some sort of an issue as to whether or not the president can say, I, in order to uphold the Constitution, I can't ignore this reality and go ahead and move that and just let the fight go into the courts and go yeah. ahead and pay some bills and print some money and do all that stuff. The trouble is the fight that you're spoiling for then 
uh, is going to last a long time, and uh, you don't really know what the outcome is going to be. Especially rather, to the markets, I imagine, right? right? Rather than have a situation where uh, there is an orderly process where you have debts paid, and the mm -hmm. United States says that we are going to get out of this mess, but what we're not going to do is stiff anybody. You stiff somebody, and the credit rating agencies who are not blameless in this. You know, remember the credit rating agencies were the ones that said that all those lousy uh, housing uh, bonds were going to be good are the very same people that are going to say we're going to downgrade the credit of the United States. So, but you know, Tom, isn't it, isn't it already <laughs> too late for that? I've heard some of the bonds people already say yeah. this has gone on so long that th these may be downgraded no matter what I think happens. you're seeing today, though, that might yeah. be put on a negative watch. You know, yeah. As well, opposed to actually well, downgrading. One thing we can't leave mm -hmm. was talk about what Bill Lockyer, the treasurer, did in mm -hmm. borrowing money so that California would be in yeah. fairly good shape is well, that going to help yeah of course because he's going to want to pay the bills but when you borrow that money you borrow that money at a cost and that would not be money you would necessarily have to borrow at a cost if you didn't so that's more mm -hmm. money that the people of the state of california mm -hmm. are going to have to pay mm -hmm. it's all money but the bottom line at the end of the day is that if this thing goes through if interest rates go up we are going to pay not billions but hundreds of billions of dollars of extra penalties for something that basically okay. is because a bunch of people that are acting okay. like 12 year olds to can't this down are they working over the weekend they are working over the weekend, okay. whether or not they will come up with a solution uh, is anybody's guess. Well, we've come pizza. to one solution, and that is yeah. the appointment of uh, one member of the Supreme Court that had a pretty rough time in Washington. Scott, that is your story. Goodwin Liu, that's right. A Bolt uh, Law Professor, Associate Dean over there. Uh, President Obama, as you said at the top, Elva, had tried to appoint him to the uh, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Senate blocked that, and that was in part payback for his opposition to the uh, nominations of Samuel Alito and John Roberts to the U.S. Supreme Court by George W. Bush. You know, a lot of times you see these judges, uh, they have no paper trail, uh, these nominees. They try very hard to lay low, not be controversial, especially if they're ambitious and they want to get onto the courts. Goodwin Liu is like a paper mill. Uh, he's got all kinds of writings. He's written about uh, affirmative action, the death penalty, same-sex marriage, and not hedging his bets. I mean, he's, he, he is who he is, and uh, it is uh, some people already comparing him to Rose Byrd, you know, who uh, Jerry Brown appointed to the state Supreme Court when he was governor the first time. But by all accounts, he's very smart. He's young. He's 40 years old. Uh, he's very likable. He's a good colleague. Uh, uh, but he is, uh, you, you know, you'd have to say left of center. And so it'll uh, remain to be seen just, uh, you know, what kind of a judge he'll be because he's never been a judge. Right, Scott. I mean, you're talking about the comparisons to Rose Byrd. Conservatives in California, Republican Party is already talking about this, particularly on the issue of the death penalty, saying he is very anti-death penalty. He's made some statements. How true is that? What well, do you know, he's, you know he, he's written about, he had some skepticism about the way the death penalty is implemented. But he's also said he would have no trouble uh, uh, enforcing the law, and the death penalty as of now is the law uh, of the land here in California. Uh, but uh, you know, when he was uh, when he was a nominee for the Ninth Circuit, one of the things Republic, two, Republicans said a couple things, many things really, but that he had no experience as a judge, and secondly, that uh, he was one of these activist judges who would try to use his own personal feelings about the world and uh, shape the law to, to, to that, uh, to if those feelings. If rejected, does he become a poison pill or can he down the road uh, kind of be rehabilitated, if that's the word, to be appointed at some other point? Well, you know, as I said, one of the things, one of the criticisms on him is that he'd never been a judge. Well, now he's going to be a judge and he's going to be, uh, you know, on the Supreme Court here for a while. He's a young guy, I mean, 40 years old, so in 10 years, yeah. I mean, the yeah. Senate could yeah. change, there'll be a new president, yeah. so he could certainly be appointed mm -hmm. to the, either to the federal bench or even the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. There is an unusual, uh, controversial fight going on below cries of unfairness behind the scenes, and that is that there were many who thought that the governor should have appointed another Latino uh, because of the uh, justice who just left, and also because the, there's no African American on the court, uh, and that there is now, for the first time, I guess, in the country, a court where there would be four uh, Asians. That's right. There are three Asian Americans on there now. Uh, Ming Chin is one. Uh, uh, the, the Chief Justice, Tani Kantil Sakawe, and also Joyce Kennard, and uh, Gubin Liu would be the fourth. Jerry Brown was pretty unsentimental about that. You're right, Belva. The Latino community had some candidates. Uh, the Latino caucus in the legislature put forth four uh, people that they liked. Uh, the African American community put forth one. And he uh, ignored those. He really, uh, he said uh, at the press conference this week that he liked the fact that he had been shot down by the Republicans. Uh, he liked him personally. He met with him. He and his wife did. You know, Jerry Brown 
he marches to his own drummer. He doesn't have a judicial appointment secretary. He goes with his gut and his own. I mean, he's a lawyer himself, and uh, was attorney general. So he he interviewed these all these candidates personally, and uh, he just liked Lou, and uh, chose him. And uh, he said, you know. Whenever you make a choice, you're excluding other choices. He was very unsentimental about it. He said, uh, you know, what about Irish? There's no Irish uh, members of the court either. Um, there are some openings at lower courts in California, and I'd be very surprised if at least one of those didn't go to a, a Latino uh, at the appeals court level. So I think he may try to appease the community that way. So philosophically, is this going to be a different court? Uh, or is the balance? Has the will the balance remain the same? Well, you know, there's a, a lot of change on this court uh, because Tani Cantilla Saka Ue replaced Ronald George, uh, the Chief Justice, and then we've got uh, uh, Carlos Moreno leaving and Lou coming. So the chemistry changes. You know, when you have a, it's a relatively small court, seven members, and so whenever you change one of those members, there's a different dynamic going on, and uh, he could be he he won't be any. He's, he's, he will probably be the most liberal member of the court, as was Carlos Moreno, uh, and the only Democrat appointed uh, judge. But you know, he could uh, he could be persuasive uh, as a as a he's a very has a great mind. He went to Stanford and Oxford and Yale. Um, so if if he brings other votes along with him, you know, he could you know in, on some close votes he could change the the, the outcome of some cases. Any chance that uh, this? Uh, Nomination will not go through. I don't think so. Uh, there's a three <laughs> three person panel that includes Kamala Harris and mm -hmm. Tani Cantil Sakaui, the Chief Justice, and another judge. They're all uh, eager to have that member uh, mm -hmm. put on the court. They've already scheduled the oral arguments for Prop 8 in September, September 6th, and you can be sure they don't want to do that with a temporary judge sitting in as they've been doing for the last several months. So I think it's pretty clear he's going to get confirmed pretty So quickly. the timeline will be short. I mean, maybe yes, I mean, I think it'll be done by the end of August, uh, and uh, it'll be a very you know, kind of a love fest. Okay. <laughs> He's been vetted already, so they know a lot about him. Well, we're talking about one appointment by Governor Brown, and uh, Carla, you're here to talk about some other things the governor did, signing some bills that uh, created some controversy, something he seems to enjoy. That's right. Uh, well, well, the Goodwin Lou uh, um, nomination, you know, fired up conservatives. They said, there goes that liberal Jerry Brown again. He's been signing laws uh, now that the budget crisis is over in California, and it doesn't really fit that straight on liberal uh, profile that uh, a lot of people thought. I mean, you mentioned the DREAM Act at the beginning of the show, very important to Latinos. Uh, this is, it was vetoed three times. Uh, this is the one that allows undocumented students to attend uh, California state colleges and universities and apply for scholarships. Uh, in terms of state funding, they're hoping that that will come later. But at this point, this was a a real big victory for uh, Gil Cedillo, who's been trying for this for a long time. Uh, the, the governor's also signed the LGBT History Act. Of course, you, we, you've talked about that on the show. That's now been uh, fired up uh, conservatives, and they are getting together a ballot uh, measure. Uh, they hope for the June ballot to uh, repeal that law. So that's another area. Um, but on the other, you know, the, the governor has also done some things that have uh, made uh, liberals unhappy. Uh, he vetoed adult daycare centers. Uh, this was an $85 million uh, outlay. Uh, the governor said that Medi-Cal is going to be kind of filling in the holes there, but a lot of the people who, who run these adult uh, daycare centers say fragile seniors, uh, poor seniors, these people are really going to suffer. Brown took a lot of hits uh, in, in editorial boards and, and in the press this week on that one. So I think, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of different things going on, and uh, I think one of the most important things today, uh, he signed the bill on moving California's uh, presidential primary to June. Uh, that is saving money and uh, putting California perhaps a little bit more back in the mix on the presidential primary. So, wait, it, wait, it, we changed this one. Yeah, now, we changed what, what it was once. It? <laughs> it, it, it was moved up by Governor Schwarzenegger, who said, hey, we're forgotten by the time it gets to June, let's move it to February. But then you may remember uh, about a million states moved up to February also, and there was a Super Tuesday. California didn't matter at all. Now the feeling is, uh, well, let's go back to June, and that way uh, we only vote once on all the primaries. We save, uh, uh, I think, around uh, eighty million dollars, hundred million dollars. So it's it's a uh, it's a good cost cutting measure. Some Republicans aren't happy on it uh, about it. Uh, they think that that will sort of uh, minimize or uh, at least uh, affect their vote somehow. But the fact is, um, Brown has done a number of things around all around the political uh, circle. Uh, you know, it reminds yeah. me, if, 
Jerry Brown, of course, perceived as a very liberal guy, and in many ways he is. But if you think back to the first time he was governor, he had a lot of uh, fights with uh, the Democrats in the legislature. He was not, you know, a big state spender. workers overpay. That's yeah. right. We're going. We're going. You're absolutely right, Scott. You're, we're going, seeing some of the same things uh, that came back in, in, in his first two terms. We're seeing sort of vestiges of, yeah. you know. The, the cheap skate mode <laughs> is one of them. Do you, get, do you get the impression that he's happy doing this, though? Because, you know, it's it's a tough job under even good times, but this is, you know, a lousy time well, to you know, be in public office. He's having fun. And you're right, and there's a lot of speculation. Is he acting uh, as a guy who is not going to run for this job again? Uh, there's, there's a tremendous amount of speculation on that. Um, a lot of people say, look, he, he just seems to be sort of hitting, swinging for the fences, and, uh, you know, whatever happens, happens. Uh, on the other hand, we've asked him a number of times. He doesn't rule it out. Uh, he's taking a lot of hits, uh, you know, on that. For instance, on, in, in vetoing these adult uh, senior, uh, senior centers this week, one of the critics said uh, they were very disappointed to see Governor Brown do that, seeing that he's a senior himself. <laughs> um, yeah. The age factor is is a factor that a lot of people talk but about. You know, you think. You might be tempted to go another term just because the economy will probably be better. I mean, it's no fun presiding over this economy. There's you know, all you that. can't really do anything. Yeah, exactly right. And there's the issue of, um, for both parties, really, who exactly is on the bench to take on this job? <laughs> uh, you know, Brown got in there because of the experience factor and the fact that uh, he said, look, I just want to do some good for California at this stage of my life. He's used that term a, a number of times. So I think it's still, I think the jury is still out on exactly what he wants to do, but certainly the budget battle was no fun and uh, it was one of the reasons why he and his wife just decided to go off to the Sierras and go hiking uh, with uh, with bears and other <laughs> wild animals rather than to face the legislature again in Sacramento. So there's no clearer picture of this Jerry Brown than there was of the first no, Jerry it, Brown. No, as you said, sort of uh, somebody who, who uh, does uh, things all over the board, depending, but a careful study, but doesn't fit any particular program. And not very sentimental about it either, I think. Uh, someone, yeah. You know, kind of cold calculation and... Uh, let the chips fall where they may. Exactly, exactly. So more, more to come on this. Well, my thanks to all of you for joining us here tonight. Thank you.